coached at Bernstein. I, I coached at John Muir in Pasadena for oh, okay. uh, a couple years. And when we were living in Pasadena, we actually went to church. There was a church at, at Bernstein High School. And yeah, so I'm in LA. Yeah, it's yeah. a really beautiful school. <laughs> um, obviously, you know, you got into coaching. And I think, you know, when we were going back and forth beforehand, um, Asians in football is different too. And I know on your Twitter feed, you have like a, a Japanese flag. And I played with a Korean at UC Davis, Victor Lee. He was a good player. Um, and other than that, I think that was probably like my only experience with playing. You know, I think it's predominantly a sport, at least in the circle that I've been, like a lot of white, a lot of black. At the school I played high school, I was like a lot of Hispanic. But what is the experience like being involved in a sport where maybe there isn't as much representation from your ethnicity? Yeah, you know, to, to be honest with you, and again, um, sometimes I could be a little naive um, and, and uh, you know, super tunnel vision um, just because, you know, as a head coach, you just, you're just uh, always thinking about your players and the program and what do I need to do? And, um, and so, I mean, I would say till recently when all the issues with race and stuff came up, like, I honestly never – like thought about it too much you know um I never felt I was ever discriminated against or you know not given an opportunity because of uh you know my race or my nationality um I never thought you know um I never thought that I got stereotyped in terms of oh well he's Asian he probably doesn't know much or you know he's um he's probably not very knowledgeable <clears throat> um so I just, I, you know, I, I, I'm a firm believer in if you put in the work and, um, you know, and you treat people right and, and you, you kind of know your place, you know, like I, I, I take pride in not overstepping my boundaries and respecting authority and um, doing what my principal wants me to do, et cetera. Um, I just feel like when you focus on the things you can control, I, I feel like the opportunities will come and, and it's, it's, you know, that's happened with me. And so, again, maybe a little bit of tunnel vision, a little bit of, not, uh, you know, being naive, but also, you know, just really taking pride in uh, working hard. I, again, I just never really um, thought of it as a barrier and um, really something that, you know, never really crossed my mind. It's something, I mean, you know, people will joke around, you know, joke about and all joke about, you know, um, like, well, uh, you know, I, I should be coaching tennis, but <laughs> I, I'm coaching <laughs> football, you know, uh, cause a lot more Asians play tennis, but, um, you know, again, we'll joke around, but again, in, in reality and, um, in all seriousness, um, it's, it's, it's never been something that I thought about too much. Hmm. Well, let's, let's start with maybe your playing journey. Cause I know you played in college as well. How did you, get interested in football and what was that experience like as a player yeah so um I came to uh America when I was uh around seven and I had no idea what football was and you know the two big sports in Japan were soccer and baseball and I was pretty into soccer um but when I was probably like around eight maybe a year into be me being in America um I was I was uh getting babysat by a family friend and um <clears throat> they had a son that played high school football and um I think they were like maybe doing yard work or something so they needed to just kind of keep me busy and so they put in uh, his highlight film on in the VCR and just had me watch it and I just I don't know um they said that when I when they came back I was still glued to the TV and and you know I, I didn't I, I couldn't speak uh very well uh in terms of English and they said that I just kept saying football football <laughs> football and, uh, I don't know I think I mean I just kind of fell in love with it right away when I saw that film and and then I started kind of following teams and um and I wanted to play right away but my mom you know, her being new to the country as well. She didn't know too much about it. So she was like, well, why don't you play soccer, get, you know, acclimated to the, you know, sports world in America and maybe get used to the aggressiveness of football through soccer. And um, 
and then you can maybe play uh, in a year or two. And so I played one, uh, a year of soccer and the next following year, she let me play. And I was in, uh, I think, third grade at that point. And I, yeah, I played all the way through um, high school. In high school, I, I had a really good uh, head football coach, Jim Shapiro, who kind of became a father figure in my life because I didn't have a father. You know, um, my, my dad stayed in Japan after the divorce and my, my mom and I just came here. And then um, again, just my love for the sports grew and, um, and the fact that I had great, you know, I, I, I met great, uh, you know, uh, role models through the, the, through the game. It just made me fall in love with it more. And then I got an opportunity to play um, at an NAIA school in Chicago, Trinity University. And, um, you know, most of my school was gonna get paid for. And so I, I jumped on it and I wanted to keep playing. And then again, I met, uh, coach Andy Lambert, um, my head coach at Trinity, who again just you know taught me more about life through football and taught me how to be a, um, a good man through football and yeah, and so it was pretty clear that that's what I wanted to do, uh, whether it was just being a teacher or you know maybe coaching um, that I wanted to do the same thing uh, for my career so yeah it was a great experience that talk about I think it's it's always interesting to hear about coaches who've made a big impact and a lot of the audience you know a lot of our clients are high school football coaches we were started by football coaches so a lot of the guys who are going to listen to this are are in your shoes to some degree what made coach Shapiro and coach Lambert humans men that you were drawn to just that they they didn't just teach about um, you know, football and, um, coach Shapiro, just, you know, um, a guy that was always positive that always, you know, um, showed that he cared about me off the field, you know, um, and we would, uh, I went to a Christian school. Um, it was a private school and, um, you know, he would hold Bible studies for, you know, the, the, for the players and the things that he would teach us through that. Um, I just, yeah, I mean, you can just tell that it wasn't just about football with them, you know. And, um, again, I was kind of craving that, whether I knew it or not, just because I didn't have a father, you know. Uh, my mom did yeah. a amazing job, but there's just certain things that, like, she couldn't do, you know, that a man can do or or, or to have the impact that a man can have on a, on a male. And um, and then Coach Lambert was the same way, you know. Uh, we had Bible studies, and um, he would check up on me and um, hold me accountable. and um, you know, the thing that I really try to take pride in as a coach right now is just find teachable moments. And he, I thought he did that really well when, when there was something good or bad, he would, you know, talk to me about, Hey, like you, this is why you couldn't do that. Or this is why you need to do this, you know, and not just tell me, Hey, you got to do this, but he would hmm. tell me why and how it's going to benefit yeah. me as a future husband and father, you know, and that's, again, the term I use a lot now with our kids, you know, um, we're trying to help you become better future workers, husbands and fathers. So that's why we're doing this or that, right? And uh, uh, I thought he did a really good job of um, explaining to us, this is why you can't or you can or you need to do this because of, um, you know, my future. Yeah, a lot of coaches disregard the why. They just want the what or the result that they want. And it's, it's a disconnect between them and kids. And definitely, like you're saying, good coaches are able to explain the reason for yeah. things. That's the common question every like young kid or toddler asks, like, well, why or what? You know, it's like they, they want to know that at a young age. You, you kind of started, uh, at least from my research, uh, gaining more traction and um, exposure and awareness to the coaching world when ESPN did an E60 feature on you, which was really cool. Um, this concept of tell people who they're becoming uh, and this idea of having parents write letters to kids and how they love them and instilling positivity and good things into them. And I just watched the movie Boys in the Hood. Have you seen Boys in the Hood? Oh yeah, one of my favorites. Killer movie. I'd seen it a number of times, but my wife and I were weeping on the couch all weekend watching it. and in that movie there's a lot of scenes where it's like 
telling, you can see with certain kids, the mom tells them good things about who they are. And then with other kids, uh, depending on kind of who their dad was, they would tell them negative things about who they are and just seeing how their life trajectories went after being told that. How did this concept, I know you've shared it probably plenty of times in the past, but I'm sure there'll be people listening to this who haven't heard it. How did that concept start? And like, what was the impact made through those letters? Yeah, so um, when I first became a head coach at Bernstein um, in 2012, I made a uh, pact with myself that as long as I'm a head coach, that I will, I, I will visit three su successful coaches or programs every off season. And um, luckily I've been able to st stick to that commitment the last eight years I've been a head coach. And I mean, I, I, I think that's one of the reasons why we've been successful at Bernstein and Lincoln, um, just because I'm able to, you know, steal great ideas from great coaches and we just make it ours. You know, um, I always hear, um, I always say great, great coaches are great thieves. And, um, you know, I try to steal as much as I can. And the first coach I visited um, when I was home for Christmas break after that first season, um, I was the head coach. Um, I was visiting home in uh, Seattle and I knew about a coach that, was really successful and actually my friend played for him um when we were in high school and just always was raving about him his name is tom boehner at bothell high school and um he was one of the guys i first you know i, I visited and that was one of the uh, things that they did you know um and i i fell in love with the idea but then as i reflected more about it i was like well he's at a pretty affluent school and it's been pretty powerful for him so um, imagine what it could do for our kids in at Bernstein who are, you know, um, who, who come from inner city homes and, um, you know, most of them have moms or just, just moms or, uh, you know, some live with their aunt and uncle and I know they're working 24 seven and they probably don't get, you know, told that, that, the, the positive things that they should hear all the time, whether it's because the parents are too busy or they just, you know, they're not great at expressing words or whatever it is, you know? And, and then I started thinking more and saying, you know, we have a lot of issues with gangs and drugs and um, kids not trying, you know, in classes or whatever they try to do. Um, they they don't really give great effort. And I personally believe it's, it's because they don't feel loved, you know, from the, from the one person they or two people they need the love from the most you know which are whether it's mom or parent you know both parents or dad and um so i wanted to get to the root of that problem and um and i wanted to do this and so what i did was that uh that june uh so i got the idea in december over christmas break and then june um i wrote a letter to all the parents and uh, one in English, one in Spanish. And then I sealed it up in an envelope with a blank sheet of paper that they could write their letters on. And I gave it to all the players and said, hey, you have uh, two weeks to bring this back to me, but make sure it's sealed, make sure you don't read it, okay? Um, and <clears throat> they brought it back like sometime after uh, ju uh, July 4th. And um, instead of, after working out, we usually go practice. And uh, instead of going out to practice after the workout, we I said, "Hey, we're all going to go into the, we're going to go into the gym." And I uh, told them, "Hey, remember the letters that you brought back to me? Uh, well, these are love letters from your parents. And for the next 20 minutes, you're going to find a place in the gym by yourself and read these uh, to yourself." And uh, handed it back out. And I mean, five minutes in kids were sobbing and crying and, you know, sniffling. And uh, I was just kind of walking around, you know, and, and, and just, uh, it was crazy to see the reaction. And then afterwards I brought them back together and I just told them, Hey, like you have no excuse from now on. Like you, you if, even if it's just one person, you are loved and you are cared for. So like mm. this has to give you the inspiration to keep going and, and to make something out of your life, you know? And I, and we also reiterated that you have a family here, uh, you know, in, in amongst the football program and we're here for you, the coaches and the, and the, you know, teammates. And so again, you really have no excuse to not to do well with your life, you know? And so, mm. yeah. And then I, I, I kind of open mic'd it. Um, I, I, you know, and your kids want to share what's on their heart or what they feel about the letter come up and share. And a bunch of kids came up and said, like, like one kid was like, 
I, I didn't know my dad loved me until this letter, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, just a bunch of powerful stuff. And uh, we really came together and um, yeah, we had a, and I, you know, I, I, I'm not saying that's the only reason why, but I think this was one of the reasons why we, we were able to, you know, have a really successful season that year, uh, season that year. And, um, you know, kids played for each other and kids knew their, you know, their teammates pain. And um, I always say like, you can't, I, I don't think you can truly care for someone unless you know their pain. Um, and this allowed them to share each other's pain. And so now it's like, Hey man, John, I know what Johnny's gone going through or has gone through now. I, you know, I got to take care of him. You know, it's kind of like that empathy mentality and, um, and yeah, they just, it was a really close team that year. And, and, um, you know, back to school night, uh, that, that, that fall, uh, when parents would come, uh, they, they, they would come thank me, <laughs> said, thank you for that experience because it's, it brought me closer to my son. And, um, yeah, so just a lot of positives came out of it. Um, but most importantly, you know, bringing the families closer together and giving more confidence to the boys. That was awesome. Hmm. Hmm. I remember watching it, but even hearing you, you know, communicate it again, it's really powerful stuff, man. And I know you've heard that many times. And sometimes when you get that feedback all the time, maybe it goes numb, but I hope you hear that. It's like, it's extremely powerful. My dad was not told he loved, his father loved him in his life. My dad always mentions it. My dad never told me I love him. My dad never told me I love you. And he's made sure as hell that he tells me he loves me all the time because wow. it's super, super important. And uh, even you know, I'm about to be a dad. I'm thinking of that all the time now too. Like, what am I going to instill in this human? It's, it's made a massive impact. I know you're up in uh, at Lincoln now, but how else you know, one of the things that leaders have to do is kind of continue to be innovative and continue to find different ways to speak. I had Coach Niblet on at Hoover High and down in Alabama, and he's like, you know, I was wondering, yeah, the guy will knock your hair off. He's like, I was wondering, is my voice grown faint? Are people listening to me anymore? You know, best program in the South, pretty much. And he's like, he's doubting himself because they haven't won a state championship in three years. So I'm like, golly, the bar is high. But how do you as a coach continue to be innovative, continue to believe in your own message that you're giving to your athletes when you're coaching year after year? And, and maybe you see some kids not react well to it and you kind of doubt yourself for a moment. How do you push through that? And what are you currently doing with your program now? Yeah. So, the, yeah. Uh, so the first part of the question, um, how do I continue to believe? Um, well, you know, I, when I came to Lincoln um, in 2015, I, you know, I had been a head coach for three years at Bernstein and um, I, I came to Lincoln replacing uh, John Kitna uh, and, you know, and it, uh, that was his, uh, Lincoln's his alma mater. And he, um, the three years he was there, you know, he kind of built the program and um, put some money into it and, and did some good things. And, um, you know, it was not an easy experience for me. Uh, to replace us, you know, someone like that. And um, I think kids deep down were hurt and um, I was going to get the brunt of it, you know? And, um, and now I, I can say that and I can look back and say, you know what, it, they weren't really against me. They were just hurt, you know? And I, I, I totally understand that now, but why I'm saying that is um, I got a lot of pushback, you know, um, anything that we didn't do that was similar to what he did. Um, I was questioned and, you know, I mean, I got cussed out by parents the first year and, um, and, and I mean, we went 10 and one and I got cussed out, you know, <laughs> like it was, it was a rough year. Not but, good enough. You lost a game. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that, that year really, um, forced me to, uh, um, think about, okay, who am I, who am I really? And who am I as a coach? What are our values? What is this program going to stand for? You know, because, I mean, I had some of that stuff at Bernstein, but I feel like it was just, I would grab whatever sounded cool, you know, not something that I truly believed in because it was who I am. And hmm. um, that year after that first season, I almost stepped down because I, I had such a tough time, you know, um, but through counsel and through some mentors uh, talking to me, I decided to stick it out, but I knew I needed to think about those things. And so uh, at the same time, I had read, uh, um, 
you know, uh, Win Forever by Pete Carroll. And uh, he talked about how when he got fired from the Patriots, he took like a year off and, and he made a, this big binder about his philosophy, you know, and that's when he came up with like the compete, you know, always compete, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And, and then that helped him at USC, you know? Um, and so I kind of did something like that. I just brainstormed, Hey, what are my values? What's my coaching style? And then I came up with my like coaching philosophy in 25 words or less, like, like Pete Carroll says to do. And then from there, I created our vision statement for our program, our core covenants, our core values, the things that we were going to stand for, you know, and I call those three things our our North Star, our why, right? When things get tough, when when I'm faced with difficult situations or difficult decisions, that the, the my vision, my core covenants, my core values are going to guide my decisions. And so um, that process in 2015 six, and 2016 has uh, enabled me to stand firm, you know, with what I'm trying to do through our football program and what I'm trying to do for the kids. Um, yeah. And so that's my, that's my answer to question one. And then question two, just like I told you earlier, just by freaking visiting a bunch of great coaches, man. Uh, yeah. I, I, I mean, like I said, I, I, I try to go everywhere, you know, um, I went to Bergen Catholic and Don Bosco in New Jersey a couple of years ago. I go to visit California schools. I go visit colleges. You know, um, I've gotten close with the Weber State uh, staff, and uh, you know, I went down there uh, a couple some a uh, couple winters ago. And so that's how I and a lot of a lot of my questions um, as a head football coach are program stuff. You know, yes, I have some X's and O questions because I I also uh, run the defense. So, you know, I'm always trying to um, get better at that. But a lot of my um, questions when I go visit our program stuff, hey, what do you do for motivation? How do you handle discipline? How do you do grade checks? You know, all that stuff. And I steal ideas and I actually got an idea. I didn't actually go visit him, but uh, from Josh Niblet, um, you know, one of the off season competition that he does, uh, we stole and we still do till this day. And it's been a, it's been a big thing for our program. So um, yeah, my, my long answers to those two questions are that. No, that's great. There's so much to unpack in them too. I kind of want to, pick out some different parts of it um first one that should be just fun what's the what is the off-season competition I'm intrigued yeah so uh we start our off-season workout in January right um and we go all the way till basically end of May because beginning of June we start spring ball so um we have our morning workouts at 5 45 a.m and that's kind of our cornerstone of our program and um you know we we do a bunch of stuff but from April till end of May, we uh, basically do this competition. And this is how we kind of end our morning workouts. And basically, uh, we have eight teams and 16 captains. So two captains per team. And basically, uh, they'll draft their team, right? They'll draft the team for the next two months. And um, everything from that point on is team-based and uh, point based. So, you know, they lose points for uh, if, a, if a teammate loses or misses a workout, uh, they'll lose points if they're late to the workout. Um, everything in the gym is competition. So one day it will be the Spartans versus Trojans. And, you know, they're going to be going against each other in the pro agility drill and, um, you know, sprints, right? And then the next day they'll be matched up with someone else. And, um, uh, grade point averages every week we we uh you know pull uh, grade point averages and the highest team you wow. know gets a certain amount of points if i get emails from teachers saying hey johnny was disrespectful today oh what team is johnny on oh he's on uh, the huskies they lose some points um they also have to do uh like a community service or school service once a week and um as a team and they get points for that and so um yeah, they, you know, everything's tracked weekly. And at the end, um, we crown the winners and uh, the winner, winning team gets a shirt and they get gear first when uh, when we start spring football. Because in Washington, we can 
we can wear uh, pads uh, oh, okay. when spring football starts. So, you know, big, big motivation. But the great thing about that is obviously it's competition. So, you know, it's fun, but pure accountability. That's when we really yep. stress pure accountability because now when, you know, uh, Steve misses a workout. It's not me chasing them down. It's the captains that chase them down and say, hey, man, you cost us five points today. You got to be here. And not just that, but hey, do you need help? Like, what, what's going on? Do you need a ride? Okay, I got you, right? So, because those are things that they got to be willing to do during the season. So we try to teach them um, those things through that. And we always say, like, leaders aren't the ones that just yell at them, right? They help, the, they help teammates find solutions to the problem. Right. And hmm. um, and we always say as a leader, you're going to be inconvenienced like that's that's a given. Yeah. So, you know, you, but but that's why you're a leader, you know, and not everyone can be. So, you know, help your teammates find solutions to the problem. And so, yeah. And, and lastly, with this uh, on. So, you know, we add up all the points on Friday for that week. And then on Monday, we start a new week. But um, the team gets to. Uh, I give them a sheet of what what cost them points and what gained points for them last the, the prior week, and they have to you know uh, meet as a team and figure out solutions to the problems going wow. going forward for that week. And so hmm. um, again, just we teach them a lot of good uh, you know peer accountability and um, pro problem solving skills during this competition. And so we started in LA and we brought it to Lincoln. And um, as long as I'm a head coach, I feel like we may tweak some stuff, but we're always going to do this. Hmm. We have a company made up of almost all former college athletes. So it's really unique in that when we give an analogy, even like I can use a, a spread offense analogy somehow, you know, <laughs> in, in my, my sales meeting. But one of the things that like football teaches, and for me, it taught so many good life lessons and that peer accountability one, is just like really standing out to me because potentially in the workplace too, like you don't, you don't see that as much. Sometimes it's very much individualistic mm. and like hit your goal. Like, yeah. and, th and that's a thing in football, right? Like complete your assignment, do your one eleven, and then the, it'll be a good play. Right. Mm. But intersecting and, and there's a greater level of, of camaraderie and trust and and like you said kind of like putting the cards on the table and a lot of programs out there getting back to like the football sense a lot of programs out there there's probably underlying factions and tensions and uh you know groups who maybe don't even like each other but because it's not discussed because they're not working with one another maybe they just got a group of two or three at the squat rack and you don't really know why PD's late to practice or not showing up. I just think um, that that really stands out. Um, I want to hear about your philosophy too, because I think that'd be cool. But before we go there, I think this is a, a good transition into some of what we were uh, tweeting back and forth, just in terms of what you're passionate about right now and what's going on in our country. You said, hey, I have a lot of, uh, I have a diverse team. And a lot of them come from low income situations or some of them come from low income situations. Um, peer accountability in that, I think, helps break down some of the walls. But talk about empowering those groups. How do you empower those groups to have a conversation, to love one another, to break down all these walls that's going on? I know it's loaded because there's a lot of crap that goes into this. but how are you navigating these waters during this crazy time? Yeah, so I feel like um, it's been kind of like a two two step um, process since the the George Floyd uh, stuff happened. The first thing I wanted to do was just make sure you know our players were okay, you know, and um, just to just check in on them and see see how they're doing and. Um, and, you know, if they wanted to discuss anything or vent, you know, I will say, hey, if you need to vent, just reach out, you know. Um, I may not have the answers or I may not make you feel any better, but you just venting, I think, will help you, you know. Because um, when kids hold stuff in, it's going to blow up at the wrong time. <laughs> and uh, that's never good. So 
I always tell them, hey, use me to vent to, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and so that was probably the first couple of weeks, um, you know, um, encouraging them and, uh, you know, and hey, go, yeah, go protest, you know, and, and, and go speak your mind. And, um, and I also, you know, reached out to uh, like, minority owned business owners and just mm. hey if, if if there's been any damages because of the protests or looting you know let me know and i'll grab some players and we'll come clean it up and so just really wanted to show my support for how hurt they were and 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 how well and what was happening right um but then the second step is again from the start i mean this is how my mind works um right like at, 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 at some point, um, no matter if you do feel uh, oppressed or if you feel racially profiled or if you feel like you're not getting a certain opportunity to cover your, because of your color, at some point, that's still irrelevant. Like, you are still in control of your own destiny. And so my message recently has been, like, Yes, there's racism out there. Yes, there's people who, um, you know, who may uh, judge you based on your looks. But as, but I still believe hard work trumps a lot of that, you know. And and to play the victim never answers anything, you know, and mm -hmm. never fixes anything. And so, um, yeah, it's just it's it's for me like been it's just finding that balance of sympathy and empathy and I'm here for you but at the same time like you can't live in that world forever you know mm -hmm. like yes do you know cry and 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 feel angry and and whatever but at the same time like we always tell our players like just because you're going through something the world doesn't stop <laughs> you know the world keeps going so yeah. at some point you like by 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 you know um by uh, being tough and by asking for help, you gotta get past that and keep going, right? And so, um, yeah, that's that's kind of been my been my approach. And um, I've been posting stuff that talks about, you know, basically the, you know, E plus R equals O, and um, you know, it doesn't matter, get better, um, because again, there's all. I think there's all. Unfortunately, there's always gonna be racism, you know. Yeah. Um, but I think again, if you um, work hard and you do the right things most of the time it, it, it it'll work out so yeah. I, I don't want them to lose that focus and um, and I'm straight up with the kids you know like um, I, I, I you know ever since I've been link at Lincoln um, we say like colored people you know whether it's me or African Americans L Latinos a lot of times like um, we tend to sometimes play the victim too much you know, and I said, we can't do that. Like, we can't mm. do that. Hard work, man, hard work. And so, mm. so that's something that um, we've always preached, but I feel yeah. like they need to hear, especially right now, when they could, you know, maybe they could use this as an excuse to, oh, uh, you know, I'm just gonna, you know, th there's no point for me to do this anymore, you know, when they start thinking that way because they get so discouraged. I gotta keep driving home that point, like, no, 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 no. Education is something they can't take away from you and hard work will open up many doors for you, you know? Maybe, maybe some will be shut because of your color, you know, unfortunately, you know, there's still racist people out there, but you'll have another option because of your hard work, you know? So that mentality. Yeah, yeah, like you said, empathy first, some sympathy first, but then like, there's a time to grieve and then there's a time to get back on the horse and get to work and debunk some of the, the crap that's out there um that's not true you know and yeah. it motiv it's like it's a motivating you talked about talking to coaches like uh, on motivation and weight room and all these different things like that's motivating that would motivate me as, as a student athlete hey this is real this isn't probably going to end go to the protest grieve those are all very valid forms of response but where practice when you're in school whether it's looking at a freaking zoom screen or in person sometime in this next decade it's been like we're working and that would motivate me i think you've done a lot in your program it sounds like to ensure the structure which is so important having structure and discipline for your kids so that they can can succeed 
when I coached at Muir in Pasadena, which is very inner city, North Pasadena. Yeah. Um, I was the first white coach they had had in 15 years on the football staff. Um, not one white player on, in the program. And like just having a structure help these kids out. Because at home, a lot of them were foster kids and single moms and raised by the grandparents, that sort of thing. They want, like, people want discipline and structure. They don't know it, but they do, um, which is, which is really vital. Um, you let's, know, let's, uh, sorry, yeah, go for it. real quick, yeah. just, you know, I, something that really got to my heart is I was, I was just watching a show, um, you know, again, a few days after George Floyd, um, death and you know people were starting to riot and protest etc and someone said I, I think it was uh, undisputed actually Shannon Sharp and Skip Bayless and Shannon Sharp or someone said you know this is kind of like when you're at a funeral um, you feel all these emotions and you feel all this grief and you're like oh wow you know what when I get, when I leave the funeral I'm, I'm gonna go do this go do that and go change the world but a week later after the funeral is over with and all those emotions are gone, you just go back to your old ways. Right. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want that to happen to our players. Like mm -hmm. I wanted them to remember the pain and the frustration that they were going through. And when we get back to school or whatever in August, September, I wanted them to remember that and let them, let that fuel them, you know? And, um, yeah, so again, I just didn't want it to be, I, I didn't want it to be all oh, these emotions for two weeks and then oh, back to our normal lives. And, you know, and so I wanted to make sure I really hit that point across like, hey, they're, now use this for a positive. Yeah, hmm. that's really powerful. Thanks. Thanks for sharing again, coach. Uh, let's, one of the things we did as a company recently, um, maybe a year ago, we kind of, I wouldn't say rebranded because um, that's just a logo, right? That's just an exterior. But we really re-envisioned and reworked our mission, vision, core values. Because what we had been seeing was, you know, these were created by kind of a different company almost. Like we had a lot of different people involved. We were growing and we realized we, we don't think our team was resonating with them as much as they could have been. Um, and so we, we did that work with our team so that we made sure it was like, okay, this is what we're passionate about as a company. When you go back and, and look at that process for you that you did a handful of years ago, you talked about Pete Carroll being, you know, inspirational and in helping you figure that out. Um, what is your team's philosophy? What are your core values? What was that process like? Um, obviously, you don't have to share them verbatim, but whenever I ask coaches this, I think it gets at things you really care about. Um, and like you said, it's a guide for you and your program, which I think would be great for others to benefit from. Yeah, so it, it starts with our vision, right? I, told, I shared that we have the three levels. Um, it, it starts with the vision because that's our why, why, basically why this program exists and what we are trying to do through the program. And again, it's also our North Star because when we are in a difficult position and, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a human, I want to win, right? And sometimes um, my instinct is to, say, okay, well, we got to win. So let's, let's not worry about this right now. Right. But at the same time, but so that's when I go back to the vision, I'm like, well, no, it's not about the wins. Right. Um, it's about helping these kids first and hopefully the wins are a byproduct. And so um, it starts with the vision and our vision is to build champions on and off the field and help them become productive citizens while relentlessly pursuing championships. So basically, you know, our vision for the program is to, to build champions on and off the field. And we always tell the kids, champions aren't the ones that are holding up the trophy at the end. Champions are the ones who are doing the right things all the time when no one's looking, who, who's committed, who works hard, who cares about their teammates, et cetera. And so we wanna, through football, right, and using football as a vehicle, help them, um, help them become champions so that when they leave our program, they're uh, productive citizens, right? right? Part of our vision is 
but why are we letting us do personal championships? So football is still important to us. Like we're gonna we're gonna train year round and we're gonna teach you good text, X's and O's and we're gonna work hard, right? But first and foremost, it's to help them become um, champions. Then second, we have our core covenants and covenant means, you know, promise or an agreement amongst each other. And this is basically these four things are what we're gonna do once we join the program and it's gonna help us fulfill the vision. And number one is love. And in our program, love means you can depend on me, right? It's not a feeling, it's not an emotion, it's being dependable to the people you love. Next is ownership. Uh, and we define ownership as it's my life, so it's my responsibility, right? We always tell the kids, don't, don't ask someone to do something for you that you can do yourself right? Like to own, own what you need to do, own your life, right? There's no reason why I should know your GPA better than you know it, <laughs> right? Like mm. you got to own your academics. You got to own these things. And so um, that's number two. And then accountability is number three. Um, it's hold myself and my teammates to high standards. And we always tell them before you hold someone accountable, you got to hold yourself accountable, right? Mm -hmm. You can't tell someone to be on time and then you're late yourself. And then number four is discipline. The future, what I want in the future is more important than how I feel now. And, you know, an example I always give to the kids is, hey, when that alarm clock goes off at 5 a.m., how you feel that at that moment is, I want to go back to bed. I'm tired. But because in the future you want to be a great football player and you want to go to college, whatever, you ignore how you feel and you get up. And that's, that's really discipline, right? Like you ignore how you feel at the moment because you want something later, mm -hmm. right? And so those are our four core covenants. And again, um, those are agreements that we coaches and players make amongst each other so we can get to that vision. And then the third one is our non-negotiable, our core values. And basically, you know, we always tell our kids, it's not, don't think of it as rules, but it's a, it's a map. And if you follow this map, you'll have a good chance of being successful. And it's non-negotiable. So if you don't fulfill these things, you will be held accountable, right? We can't say it's non-negotiable and then, oh, it's all right, we'll let it slide. And so number one, always protect the team. Uh, I feel like that covers pretty much everything, right? Once you, I always tell them, once you start your own family, your choices affect other people. And so again, like everything you do, you got to protect the team. Number two, respect everyone, especially women. Uh, number three, be on time or be honest. I'm sorry. Number four, be on time. And then number five, no drugs or alcohol. And so, and again, those five non-negotiables hopefully will guide you to be a, you know, champion and, and, and productive citizen. And so, you know, we're going to hold, and we're going to hold you accountable for breaking these things. Right. And we always say, uh, well, it, we're not, we're not punishing you. We're changing your behavior. And, um, when kids hear that, you know, they're like, okay, I'm not getting punished. They're like coach coaches, um, making me do these bear crawls for being late because he, you know, because in my, when I get a job, I can't be late. So I got to change my behavior. Right. And so, mm -hmm. uh, getting back to the why of everything, you know, before, like when I was young and dumb, I would just yell at the kid, you know, but now being a little bit wiser and more experienced, I yell at the kid, <laughs> but yeah. I tell them, Hey, this is why I'm yelling at you. Right. And then after they do their bear crawls or whatever, I hug them up and say, Hey, you know, go, go, go join your team. Hmm. So. Two things stand out, man. One, a tremendous sense of awareness, self awareness on your behalf. It's you've done a lot of work and it's really apparent. Um, any leader has to kind of deal with their own journey, their own story, their own self uh, in order to, I think, fully lead into who they are with others. The second thing that stands out is excellent communication and ability to articulate what you want from the kids. Like you said, a lot of coaches are poor in this regard. They don't know how to do it maybe because it's frustrating and it's emotional. And again, I'm thinking about being a dad. So I'm thinking about sleepless nights and trying to calm a baby down and, and being like, man, I might lose it. Right. Like everyone at that stage might lose it. High coaching and high school kids, golly, 14, 15 year old kids, self-control, respect, all of those things. But 
instead of using it as a crutch and an excuse for why kids aren't obeying or why kids aren't coming to practice or why are they always late, setting really good groundwork of rules uh, and communicating it excellently so that they cooperate and behave. And I know your program's not perfect, but it's super impressive. I've gotten to talk to a lot of great coaches the last few months, which it's just been like an honor because there's so many good coaches out there. Um, but dude, you stand out so much. And I know you've probably been showered with praise before, but I, I appreciate you being able to, to share who you are, share what your program's like. I know it's going to bless others. I'd love to do some chalk for a handful of minutes. We normally go through a little bit of film where we can go over a concept or a play or a discipline or a technique. I don't know if you want to share your screen and do some huddle or what your schedule's like, but it'd be great to do a little bit of that before we close out. Yeah, I, I, I prepped something, um, and it's nothing uh, crazy or, you know, mind-blowing, but um, something that I've gone, we've gotten compliments on in terms of our defense is how we're able to go into multiple fronts. Um, and uh, this is something uh, I learned at Cathedral Catholic, uh, mm. that's where I started my coaching career. And um, it's I down mean, in San Diego. Yeah. 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 Oh, nice. Um, yeah. Super nice guy. They're clients of ours and good friends. Oh, yeah. 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 And, so uh, Sean Doyle, Sean Doyle and uh, Sean Doyle and uh, the head coach and then John Montali, the DC they're, they're, they're definitely, uh, you know, I considered them to my mentors and especially on the defensive side. Um, I, you know, I go to John Montali still a lot. And, uh, but this is like the front system that I um, took away from them. And um, I mean, that was in 2006, and 2007 and 13 years later I'm still using it so um for maybe some of the uh uh maybe newer DCs or younger DCs hopefully this will be helpful so um, am I able to share right now yep you should be good yeah I'm excited man we've the only D-line stuff we've gotten I don't know if you know Whitney up in Rockland we had Folsom and some Sacramento area coaches on okay we did some we did some like the zone drops from DNs and stuff because he's got a kind of undersized D line that he wanted to utilize and coverage and confuse, you know, getting some passing lanes and yeah. you know, tipping pass and and that was fun. But we haven't done anything like this, so this will be great. Yeah, I mean, again, not nothing crazy. Um, <laughs> so here's something that. So this is um, our numbering system in terms of uh, technique, our D line technique. And obviously, you know, kit, people will have different, you know, ones they'll have, you know, um, they might do two I or, you know, four I, but this is the numbers that we use, right? So this is something that we introduce to our D line first day, right? So these are the techniques. And if we say seven, you know, you're gonna line up head up, right? And then the second page, yeah, this is uh, kind of like the main part, right? So we, we, uh, we always start with our um, odd front, which is our 55, okay? So the first number um, represents where the strong end will line up. So right now it's strong left because of the tight end and then and the technique he uses. The second number is for the tackle, the weak end basically, right? Um, because he's more of a hybrid, our bullet, he's more of like an outside backer D end. So he, technically our weak side end, okay, uh, the tackle. And so the nose is the one that kind of has to remember where he lines up. But these guys are basically told by the play call. So for example, if we call 55, so, you know, I just put up a five, they know, okay, it's strong left because the, the, the mic and the, the wheel will yell strong left, right? Liz, Liz, Liz. And so that strong end knows, okay, I'm a five technique. And if I'm a five, three, one, or zero, I am a jam and read. I'm gonna jam my lineman and read him, read his block. And then the second number is also a five. So the tackle thinks to himself, okay, I'm the weak weekend and I am a five. So the nose knows, okay, in 55, I am a true nose. Because if I hear double numbers, I am always a nose, right? And then the bullet is uh, now the outside backer. Right. So if, if we want to like drop eight or something, we're, we're predominantly a four down lineman. But, you know, if, we're, if we want to drop eight because it's a pass situation, I might call 55. So then if I call 53 now, OK, 
all right, I'm a five because I'm the strong end. And then now the weak end knows, okay, I'm a three. So the nose always knows I'm always the opposite of the tackle if it's not a double number. So if he's a three, I'm a one. So now we're, we get into our uh, under front. And then if they ever hear a four, then that they're, uh, they're not a jam and read, they're a crash technique. So now let me show you the different fronts we go in. So obviously again, first one, 55. That's basically our three, four odd front, right? Five, five. We want to go to under front because we want to maybe protect this Leo, right? Okay. It's five, three. And so now the bullet knows, okay, since there's no more end, I have to come down and I'm the new D end. Okay. If I want to go into a over front, 51. And so again, the nose knows, okay, he's a one. Now I'm a three. Again, bullet knows, okay, there's no DN, so I'm going to be the new DN. And then if we want to like slant, we'll call 54. So remember fit five. And remember the four is a crash technique. So now he's going to start look. It's going to start, it's going to start as a 55, but then during cadence, he's going to go head up and then crash and the nose knows, okay, I'm slant away. So that's, um, and then lastly, oh, I'm sorry, 45 is now the strong end is the four, right? And he's going to crash, and then now he's the five. So, um, so Brock, it, so let's see if you're a good student here, okay? If I, am, if I call 33, right, 33, where's our uh, strong end be? Uh, your strong end. If I call 33. Well, I know you're going to have a nose. I followed that yeah. much. I yeah. know you're going to have a true nose. Uh, I guess since I haven't heard a three to start, that first number is, is the end, yes? Yep. So the strong end, yep. Where okay. We, so what technique will he be? Is he not in a three? I guess uh, yeah. I'm assuming, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. Remember Good. the first, I'm, first number. Did I, the first okay. number that's what I thought. I thought it was a trick question. I'm like, is this a trick question? <laughs> and then the weekend will be where? Uh, three. Yep. So yeah. that's our bear front. Okay. 30. I love the bear. Now you're talking my language. I love the bear. I'm a D-line guy. Okay, yep. So, yeah. So now he's going to be a three, and he's going to be a three. And now we're in that bear front. And then last one that we use a lot is 71. So now, you know, if they're – getting us on sweeps or something. Now we're, he's going to be a seven and then one. So as you can see, um, we can go into multiple fronts just with this numbering system. And, you know, really it's these two guys that have to do the thinking, but really it's already told to, oh, I mean, I'm sorry. The nose is the one that has to kind of think, right? But for the end and the tackle, it, they're told, you know, basically where to line up. And again, the nose knows, okay, I'm always the opposite of where the tackle is. If he's a one, I'm a three. If I hear a double number, I'm a true nose. And so, yeah, I, again, um, you know, when we brought this to Lincoln, the D-line coach that stayed on with us was like, coach, I, like, I'm, I'm, wherever I go, I'm going to use this numbering system. Mm -hmm. So easy. Yeah. You know? Again, Very simple. It's, not, yep. it's nothing crazy or innovative, um, but – I think it tailors to the high school kids really well because again, yep. uh, they just hear the number and they know exactly what front to go into. You know what we see a lot of is that on the offensive side of the ball, right? We see a ton of, you know, when, when I was coaching at Concord high, you kids got the wristband and they're literally like red two is like zone block, right? Like, you know, it, it literally tells you your steps even. You don't even get the play on there, which simplifies it for a kid to play faster. And there's probably pros and cons to it, but I think it was largely beneficial for our kids. Defensively, sometimes you don't always have that. Sometimes defenses can feel really complex, you know, even coverage stuff. And so to allow a defense to also play fast and to also be able to, you know, you want them to, in a sense, not think as much and be able to react and, and play instinctively because it's ingrained in them already. Mm. So that's, that's good to share, man. Any other uh, follow-up just that you wanted to share about that? 
Uh, no, like I said, that's that's what I had prepared for you guys because cool. I have been, yeah, I've been uh, getting a lot of uh, compliments or inquiries about like, hey, how do, you know, how, how are you guys able to go into so many different fronts? And so um, this is kind of like the first time I've shared our numbering system. But again, I I got it from, you know, Cathedral Catholic and uh, it's it's worked well for us. Yeah, that's another takeaway I'm going to have from this three successful programs every off season yep. doing a deep dive with them. Like yep. you said, all great coaches are thieves. That's totally true. Yep. It's the prideful ones who, who won't sit down and, and listen and learn because that's where the best ideas are shared and whatnot. And I, I know that when you're going to those schools, I'm sure they're getting a ton out of what you do too. That's the beauty of sometimes in the off season, laying the competition aside and, and getting to, to get to know other coaches in and around your area or like you said around the country which is cool to see yeah you know we, uh I, I like clinics and clinics is something that um we like to do as a staff you know it's a good bonding moment and it ensures that hey like each position coach is learning something right but i for me personally to grow I got to go visit them personally because in clinic it's, it's so shallow and you know, you don't get to ask too many questions cause there's a time limit, yeah. but most of the coaches I go visit individually. I mean, I'm spending two days there, you know, I, I'll get a hotel and I'll watch them teach a class and then, you know, I'll watch them, you know, um, uh, go through a football class or whatever. And then, you know, they always make time for me to just, you know, do a three hour Q and a session. And, and so, and it's a lot more personal and I get to ask as many questions as, as I want. And so, yeah, I, I, I've really enjoyed the, the three visits every off season and it's helped our program tremendously. Hmm. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. I know it's, you know, been impactful for me. I know it's going to impact other people. Um, keep up the good work that you're doing. You're doing a ton of good work there and you have throughout your career. So appreciate you coach. And, uh, we'll talk to you again. All right. Thank you.